I need to approve that. There's something terrible has happened. Ladies, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I've lost the screen. I see that. What we're seeing is a black screen. Are you not sharing the right screen now? It says you are screen sharing. I haven't didn't do anything. All right, stop Maybe screen stop screen sharing and try again. And then just make sure you pick the right the keynote. I I I, I thought I did. Okay. Okay. So you can see me or hear me? Yes. Yes, I can see you and hear you. Looking looking marvelous. Oh, oh, we have to catch up on every little thing, Nina. We do. Um, okay, people are calling you handsome in the chat, Jonathan. So that should give you some. Thanks. We can be heard, just so you know. People are coming in, and we can be heard. We can be heard? Yes. Very handsome. Oh my God, who's that handsome? Oh, Cooper's weighing in. Okay. All right. We're going to get going in a minute, everybody. Give it to about five after as people are still coming into the, into the Zoom room. Hi, everybody. Wait, there's Sky. Um, Connolly, excellent, from our NYULA community. Hello, everybody. All right. I guess we will get the show on the road. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nina Sadowski here, uh, Program Director of NYULA, uh, for those of you that don't know me, and also currently sporting an axe in my head, which is kind of what I you know, feel like these days. But um, I did it especially uh, to represent for my old friend, Jonathan Penner. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome him back to NYULA for the second year in a row, um, which is amazing because this is also our second year. So we launched uh, this program last year. And uh, one, of the, um, for one of the first things we organized was this event, which we also did last year around Halloween. Um, and it was a great event. Last year, we did it at a converted salsa hall with beautiful architect architecture and a taco bar. Um, and mingling afterwards. This year, uh, we're doing it somewhat differently. Um, obviously, we're all here together on Zoom. Um, I do want to let you know a few uh, logistical things before we get going with the presentation. Um, one is that um, we're going to dro be dropping some stuff in the chat for you. Um, we're going to be dropping a Zoom link to the after party. Uh, it's very important that you remember to uh, copy the Zoom link before this Zoom closes down because, and we'll remind you of this again before we go, um, because you cannot be in two Zooms as one, at once. Did you know that? I've le recently learned this. Um, so uh, if you want to come to the after party, which is going to be, I think, a lot of fun, just be sure that you copy that secondary Zoom link. Um, we will also be dropping a Q code in, in the chat. Um, that will allow you to scan pictures to our mood board. You guys should go check it out. There's some cool stuff up there. And if you want to participate in our uh, contest, the costume contest, you must drop your information and your costume 
I'm aiming to go for the win here, but I think I might be disqualified. Um, if you want to uh, win uh, one of our two fabulous prizes, uh, you better, uh, you know, get yourself loaded up there because that's how Jonathan is going to pick the winner. Um, the first prize winner is going to get a one-on-one -on -one with Jonathan, in which he will talk about anything, uh, horror, screenwriting in Hollywood, being on Survivor, uh, you know, being a survivor. Um, and um, I can guarantee you, because I've known John a long time, that that is always a good conversation. Second prize, uh, it's not quite as good as cold hard cash, but it is a hundred dollar Visa gift card. So that might inspire you to, you know, share your costumes. Um, I think that's all of the logistics and business we have. Um, I'm very excited uh, to see this presentation. I know we, it's been a little altered and expanded uh, since uh, next year, uh, but one thing that I, since last year rather, but you know, one of the things that I really remember um, from last year's presentation and which really impressed me because I'm admittedly not a, an innate horror fan was how much horror can comment on society um, in much the same way that I had understood sci-fi was able to, because when you're creating sort of a new world and supernatural rules, you can comment on what's happening in the here and now in, in almost a more visceral way, word visceral intended, uh, homage to Jonathan. Um, anyway, so uh, I think that now is the time where we might need to go make some horror, um, or at least, uh, you know, feel the need to express ourselves through horror. Um, and with that, I just also wanted to add one last thing, which is at the end, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A, not in the chat, in the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your bars. And um, I will uh, be asking Jonathan those questions. I will filter through them and ask them after the presentation before the after party. I also just want to have a shout out to John's mother, Kitty, joining us from Maine. I don't know how else, how far flung people are, but uh, you know, with that, I'm gonna take myself out of here, or take this headache off my head and turn things over to Jonathan. Are you good to share your screen, John? You're not sharing your screen. Oh no. Uh, I must remind you that okay. the scanning experience is I'm sorry. It should yeah. be it should be shared. Wow, what a terrible start. <laughs> okay, I, I I don't know how to. Oh yeah, share. I I was sharing it. I was. We know. I was. All right. Is it on now? No. This is terrible, guys. I'm so sorry. Do you want to go to Plan B? No, no. Hold on. Huh? I don't know. Oh, how embarrassing. Stop, it's fine. Ava's here, my child. Ava, I don't know what to do. Share, share. Okay. There we go. Now play. Now. You're too far. Okay, ready? Yes. It gets better, folks. I would like to scan all of you in this room, one at a time. I must remind you that the scanning experience is usually a painful one, sometimes resulting in nosebleeds, earaches, stomach cramps, nausea, sometimes other symptoms of a similar nature. There's a doctor present, Dr. Gatton. I know that you've all been prepared for this, but I thought I'd just remind you just the same. There is one other thing. No one is to leave this room once the demonstration has begun. At this point, I'd like to call for volunteers. Anyone, doesn't matter. Something that will not breach the security of your organization. 
and that you will not object to having disclosed to this group. Something uh, personal, perhaps. Oh, okay. Yes, I have something. Do I have to close my eyes? It doesn't matter. Uh, yes, I have something. Yes. Can you all see me? David Cronenberg's incredible scanners from 1980. Mind blowing horror. Those are practical effects. You just took a dummy head, you put some goo in it, you get an actual shotgun and you blast the hell out of it. And now you can't see me. Well, why not? I'm right here. I can see me. Oh, this is terrible. And now it's working. Okay. Hi. That's horror. Is is when you work so hard to put something together and the technology blows you up. Like that just blew me up. Hi folks. I'm Jonathan Penner. It's going to get better. I know it is and you can trust me that it is. Uh, some of you know me from Survivor where there's no technical stuff at all for us to deal with. Uh, some of you have seen me on reruns of TV shows and movies. I was in a movie called Coneheads. This was my part. What is it? That's what I said. Thank you very much. I still get checks from that. I wrote a book about horror cinema. I've written horror movies, including The Bye Bye Man. Please go see the uncut director's cut. And uh, I'm here with The Sacred and The Scared. I thought of calling it The Gooey and The Good, but Sacred and The Scared is a much better title. Uh, if you see me, just put me underneath the red in Scared. That's the spot. You can't have scared without something that's red. You know, in the old days, folks, they used to have, um, um, they used to sell movies with something called the old ballyhoo. Ballyhoo was the pitch that they would use to get you in the theaters, right? Like to avoid fainting, just keep repeating, it's only a movie, it's only a movie. Or you will see absolutely positively the most horrifying movie ever made, Mark of the Devil. Mark of the Devil was actually rated V for violence, and they gave you a barf bag when you bought your ticket. Now, can you imagine going into a movie theater with a barf bag, wondering what the hell you had gotten yourself into? And people went there, you know, both hoping and dreading that they were going to be taken somewhere that they had never been. So, folks, please get your barf bags, just a bucket to have next to you. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The, the blowing up head was the worst thing that you're going to see. You might need no dose. You won't need a barf bag. Look, I know some of you are here with trepidation. I'm looking at you, Deb. I hope some excitement also. And exploding heads aside, I'm going to try my best not to trigger you because I'm a real believer in not letting something into me that I don't want to be there. You know, whether it's an image, whether it's a virus, a drug, an idea, another person's body or, or their emotional needs. Our bodies are our temples and we try to keep them sacrosanct and pure. And a lot of horror is actually about the, the, the desecration of that temple, you know, the unwilling, um, um, sometimes traumatic loss of innocence and self-possession and identity. I don't want to do that to you. I really don't. But there is that awful and wonderful possibility that you are going to, you know, be challenged and yes, maybe see something that is too much for you 
and that delicious juvenile dare is a great part of the fun of horror movies and of life. Are you going to be daring or are you going to be safe? Well, you're here. You're being daring and I will not violate your trust. It's going to be the perfect relationship. Okay. Folks, there are two reasons that people hate horror movies and I can't stop that. One is that they are scary. Horror movies are scary. And if you don't like to be scared, you're not going to like horror movies. The other is that they suck. Most horror movies are terrible. They're made, from, they're made from greed and they're made from hunger. But as the great author, an Irish woman named Dame Edna O'Brien, who wrote The Country Girls and a lot of great books, said about some of her hardest, toughest work, when somebody asked her, why do you write such dark stuff? She said, you know, the truth is raw. There's a rawness to the truth that needs to be dealt with. The rest of it is lurid and manufactured but as artists and as audience members, it's up to us to separate what's true and what's junk. So let's start to do that. We're going to try to separate the wheat from the chaff, right? Let's start with some terms, parameters. A horror movie has these things in it, right? It has terror, horror, death. It has a monster or the monstrous. It has the supernatural. It has um, um, viscera. And it has the uncanny or at least the unknown. My son's coming in. Something's happening. How are we going to see black? Though? I know. I'm talking. Oh. And you're ready? He says you can only see black, but now you're going to see terror. The first thing that you're going to see is, oh, could you not see my face? I hope you could. Terror, right? Okay. Every story has suspense. That's what makes a story a story. You have a character that she needs something, she wants something, and we hope that she's going to get it, and she and we fear that she's not going to get it, right? Something bad is going to happen to her. It's the two-sided coin of life, fear and desire. And every story has suspense, but if the stakes of the story are life and death or worse, it may go beyond suspense, suspense to terror. And terror is to be scared of the, the fatal or the truly catastrophic, right? You're terrified of bombs. You're terrified that the guy walking behind you on the street is gonna pull out an ax. And being terrified is kind of a fascinating thing that humans can do because what we can do is project ourselves into the future, right? It's, 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 it's what we are scared of happening in the future. People in the movies are terrified something's gonna happen and if the movie works, you're terrified for them, right? But they don't call it a terror film, they call it a horror film. They call it a horror film. Oh my God, folks, I'm so sorry. They call it a horror film, yeah. And horror is the realization of the terror, right? Your worst fears made manifest, like my fear of not being able to manipulate my computer properly. Your worst fear is realized. And realization is a great word because something can be realized in the, in the actual world, physical manifestation, and something can be realized in your head. Horror is the fact, it's the present, you are in it. The bombs that you are afraid are gonna hit you have hit you and they blew your leg off. The guy behind you has an ax and now he's coming for you. You are in the moment, which is where we all aspire to be. Live your life in the moment, horror takes you into the moment, right? And then they show you the leg getting chopped off or blown off. They show the face going like, ah! and it's scary. Viscera. It's a nice shot, but it's just some guy with stupid red paint on his fingers when you look at it closely, right? Anyone know what viscera really is? Yes, it's it's the guts. It's our it's our meat. It's the juicy stuff inside of us that goes all watery and gives us a visceral reaction. See, you're not supposed to be able to see the viscera. If you can see it, there is something seriously fucked up. There is something wrong. And there are a few organs in your body that you can see, but those two are very filled with emotion, with shame. Sometimes they look kind of monstrous, right? The organs of sex and death. And there are fluids associated with them too, secret fluids. And those literally are called secret shunts, secretions. The private parts, the softest, the nicest, the parts that feel the best are also the most vulnerable and the parts that feel the worst right? They hurt the most. And there's a tremendous amount of deep, deep 
shame and excitement, guilt, weirdness associated with viscera that goes back to when we are infants, probably into pre-consciousness. That's why horror movies move some people so, so profoundly. Not every movie shows viscera, but they all threaten to show viscera, and just that threat is scary. Okay. Death. Horror movies have death in it. If it doesn't have death in it, it ain't a horror movie. It's the Hotel Transylvania. It's a Scooby-Doo mystery. I don't know. It's something different. Okay. The monstrous. Right? A horror movie has what could be a human monster, or it could be a beast. Yeah. It could be an institutional monster. could be part of society. It's, it could be evil itself or it could just be some terrible, terrible mistake, but it's a huge, ugly wrong. If something is wrong enough, it becomes a monstrous, and horror films deal with things that are wrong. There's the supernatural and the uncanny, or even just the unknown. These films touch on elements that the majority of us really you know, believe in. We know that there are dimensions of possibility beyond our own plane of existence, the secret stuff that is sacred, you know, heaven, the beyond, that there is a veil somehow between here and the other side. And once that veil is pierced and the eternal is exposed, one of my favorite phrases that I've, I've read is, ecstasy is a hint of the eternal and horror is the reality of the eternal. Now, of course, if having all these elements alone was what it took to be a horror film, then The Princess Bride would be a horror film. It is not a horror film because it's missing the one last key, which is the intent to scare the shit out of you. That's what it takes to be a horror film. Okay, anyway, as a kid in the 1970s, and I loved all movies, the posters that I could see looked something like this. Okay? These are cute movies. You remember these, Mom? The computer wore tennis shoes. You know, these movies all had dad figures. You know, the dad was always going like, Wah! there was always some goofy dad getting thrown off a cliff. At the same time, there were movies like this. These were playing in the exact same time. And these movies spoke directly to me. These were all audience movies. Any kid could go see them. And my parents, thanks mom, wouldn't let me go. And that only made me very, very angry and frustrated. And it made this forbidden fruit all the more desirable. Didn't my parents know that when you repress a desire or a person or, or even a people, the repressed expresses itself elsewhere. Denial is very dangerous. And many horror movies deal with this. I lived it, not in a big way, but it turned me into a lifetime horror nut. My parents did let me read. And at eight years old, I was in a bookstore in Westport, Connecticut. I found this very book, which I still have. And I made them buy it for me. I would not be denied. My foolish, foolish parents. And then a couple of years later, the expanded version of this book, it's incredible. And it started a lifetime love affair with horror movies and reading about horror movies. And in some ways it was better because I poured over these books and I, I memorized everything in them. And I looked at the pictures and I dreamed up the movies and I learned what every horror fan knows is that horror is a taste, right? Your taste can give you power and identity. Horror gave me the power of yeah, because I would show stuff to people and they go, oh my God, which made me very powerful. I could repel some people and I could attract some people. It helps to define you, your taste, right? And when you have taste, you taste a certain way to the rest of the world. And I became a horror kid, a monster kid, we were called, right? Here, look at some of these images. Some of these are old. Here's a, a, a woman named June Adams. Look at this, a beautiful woman who is also a monster. I mean, if, if that didn't change a kid's life, I don't know what would. Here, here's Bella Lugosi from... The Island of Lost Souls. This movie, this is from 1932. This could have been taken at any time. This was an H.G. Wells adaptation. Bella was one of the true greats and he, he looked like a member of a chain gang or something here, right? Okay, you all have seen Parasite. I know Bong Joon-ho's movie of the year. It's a masterpiece. This was his monster movie and it's as good as Parasite in its way. It's an extraordinary movie. One of the greatest monster movies ever made. And it deals with um, um, uh, the the... the situation in Korea and North Korea. It's really a powerful movie. Here's a new one too. This is Midsummer. This is from last year, Ari Aster's new film. It's a real gods and monsters 
story. And here was a hero of mine, one of my favorites was Lon Chaney, who was the Phantom of the Opera. And this was um, the man of a thousand faces he was known. And he did all of his own makeup. And he was the son of two deaf mutes. And so he had to learn to communicate with his body, which was perfect for the silent, silent movies. He was the great horror star of the silent era. And, and he was making a movie. They had fake snow in the movie and they used to take cornflakes and they would bleach them. And he got a bleached cornflake stuck in his throat and it gave him throat cancer. And this silent film actor died at the age of 47, having only made one talking film. He was quite extraordinary. So folks, what is it about monsters that are so powerful and so attractive to some of us? They make you recoil, right, at first, but then if you look long enough, I mean, you have to pity them. There's great sadness. Look at his eyes. There's great pain. There's danger. Whoops, there's danger. Sorry, I, 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 turned, the, I turned the clicker, but not the page. Somehow, monsters are the villains, they're the heroes, and they're the victims of their own stories. They speak to the fallibility of nature and even the fallibility of God. Stories with monsters tell us that life is unfair. They want love, they want understanding like all of us, but they are hunted, they are hated, and so they're made vengeful, furious. Sometimes they're bad, and sometimes society makes them bad, and they are iconic, right? Now the next one. Okay, these are some of the most famous faces and figures of the last century. King Kong, Frankenstein, Dracula, these are all from the 1930s. Still magnificent. Kong is one of the greatest movies ever made. Frankenstein, this is Boris Karloff as the monster. He was a 40-year-old journeyman actor, and he became a star at that age, and he was forever indebted to horror. He loved horror movies. And this is Bela Lugosi again. This man died impoverished and a drug addict only less than uh, three decades after this picture was taken. A terrible, tragic story. Look, you want to make a movie that's compelling? Half of the work is done if you have a great monster. The question of why is this in the world, this brute power, this ugliness, this, this evil? And it's easier and certainly more entertaining to grapple with the dark profundities of life through horror than it is through drama or, or, or documentary. I mean, we would rather see these images to discuss what's scary than, than these images, right? And don't get me started, please, on the most famous horror image of them all, an image so moving and profound that you could literally start a religion based on. Look at this. Of course, he also rose from the grave and promised that if you eat his flesh and drink his blood, he would give you eternal life, but I'm not going to go there. That's a whole other story. Instead, let's dive deeper into some, how's that for a transition? Instead, let's dive deeper into some of the universal stories that horror can tell, like this one, right? Little Red Riding Hood. Many horror pictures, many horror stories work as cautionary tales. That is, they teach us what not to do and what to do in an emergency. So here's a tale, not this one, this is sort of a teenage Red Riding Hood, but Red Riding Hood is about a little girl who, you know, goes on the path to grandma's house. Go bring her some cookies, mom says. Now, if you're seven or five or whatever she was, that's a big deal, right? Crossing the street for the first time. You know, she's been on this walk a hundred times with her parents. Grandma only lives across the street over there. You know, she lives a hundred yards away in the woods. She's never made this trip alone. And this time she's going to make it alone. Right? And this is how we become our adult selves. We venture out and successful. We go a little further, with a little more confidence. And we learn our incremental lessons along the way. But if you go off the straight and narrow path, and you may slip, or a wolf may get you. Okay? Parents told that stories to scare the fuck out of their kids because they know that a wolf could be a real wolf, there could be a wolf in the woods, or he could be a man, a bad guy. Right? Guys on the make were called wolves. What's this? It's a wolf whistle. And some kids don't listen. And some adults also stray off the path of straight and narrow. I'm bored in my marriage. I'm looking for some kicks. But most importantly, these stories are usually about teenagers, which is teen is, of course, short for in between agers, who have to literally make their way along the path from childhood to adulthood. And that's hardly a straight and narrow path. You know, they have to navigate between the desire and the need for experience. Right? You have to have experiences. 
and the fear that they're gonna get hurt or killed or taken advantage of. And this scary, exciting journey that we all have to go through is at the heart of a lot of horror. Maybe the scariest subgenre, because it feels the least fantastical and the closest to home is the monster with the human face, which is often a white man. Yeah. Last House on the Left, this is from 1972. We were just talking with Nina about it. She still hasn't gotten over seeing this movie. Two girls go to a concert, they buy some weed, right? Let's buy some weed. Too bad the dealers take them to the country and rape and murder them. And double too bad that somehow the killers wind up in one of the girls' houses. And when the parents find out what they've done, they destroy the gang. The mother blows this guy and bites his dick off. It is outrageous. It is something for everyone. It's a cult classic from the, from the Vietnam era generation gap time of 1972. How about this? Look at this family. This is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's got the best title of any movie in the world, I think. Folks, to the rest of the world, Texas is America. You all have friends from another country who do an American accent and they all talk like JR from Dallas, okay? That's what they think that a lot of Americans are like. And look at the guy on the right, Leatherface, horror literally wearing a human face. John Carpenter's Halloween. Girls do not have premarital sex. You will get killed. That seemed to be the message of that movie. Uh, Friday the 13th. This is what happens if you bully somebody. That's what the movie's really about. Bully somebody and this guy in a hockey mask is going to stick that where the sun does not shine. Okay. Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Right? Janet Lee on the right. She goes off the straight and narrow. She robs her boss, boss of $40,000, and she winds up in this uh, uh, no-tell motel. And it's the same killer who inspired the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, inspired Psycho, a guy named Ed Gein. And there's an even scarier scenario than going off the beaten track and getting taken, and that is staying on the, uh, on the path and getting taken anyway. See, parents, I'm a parent, we teach our kids Keep away from strangers, but you got to be polite, be helpful, be helpful to people, those in need, right? Also inspired by Ed Gein, one of the best Red Riding Hood stories in the movies. It's literally about a wolf not to wear sheep's clothing, but trying to make a girl suit out of real girls. <laughs> I 
Yeah, The Silence of the Lambs, the only horror film ever to win the best picture at the Academy Awards. That's so scary. And, you know, the big eyes. I mean, he, he really is the wolf. Right? All right, let's talk about some of the other subgenres of horror. Uh, like this one. The Devil. I'm a Jew and an atheist. So the devil, the Antichrist, they don't really do it for me. But a lot of movies play with belief, right? Because we crave an explanation for the bad things that happen and for the evil that men do. The existence of a lower, higher power is actually reassuring. You know, in the same way that believing in God's plan, it was God's plan. So believing that the devil made her do it makes us a reassured. The Exorcist, this one, set around the generation gap of the 70s. And my innocent little girl, it's about a mom, my innocent little girl is turning into a vomiting monster who masturbates with a crucifix. Is it an illness? Is it my divorce? Is she hitting puberty? Or is it the devil? A lot of people identified with that movie. Rosemary's Baby, one of the best. A studio hit based on a bestseller. Most studio horror films are based on best-selling novels because they don't have a lot of imagination. This one is one of the greatest films of all time from William Castle, Roman Polanski. And it plays on our fears, not only of the devil, right, but of being gaslighted. How scary to feel that your husband, your neighbors, your doctors are all in on a conspiracy of evil, and then it turns out to be true. Or Suspiria is not really about the devil, it's just a coven of witches. But churches, schools, the government, we put our trust in these institutions and the people in charge, assuming that, you know, they're ready to take care of us and, and, and want to teach us and do us right. What if they're actually evil? This is an incredible meta horror film by a mad drug fueled genius named Dario Argento. Here's another great theme, science run amok. This is The Bride of Frankenstein. You all know who that is. It's a sequel even better than the original. They were both made by James Whale. Uh, he died in his pool. Um, uh, there's a great movie about him called Gods and Monsters. Uh, Ian McKellen won the Academy Award playing the director of Bride of Frankenstein, if you can believe it. Look, here's about science. We don't fully understand scientists. Maybe scientists do, but most of us don't. All we know is that there are people out there screwing around with stuff, you know, that, that should never be screwed around with. They're searching for Promethean fire and they're causing incredible unintended consequences like this. You could look like this. This is one of the great movies of all time. This is my favorite horror movie, The Fly, also by David Cronenberg, who did the exploding head scanners. It's a tragic romance. It's sexy, it's gooey. It made stars out of Gina Davis and Jeff Goldblum. And it's about this genius who's up in his head. And when he journeys out into the world of physical love and emotion, the trip liberates him and also destroys him. Folks, who knows the unintended consequences of what we're doing right now, right? The greatest, maybe the greatest technological uh, revolution ever. It's consumed an entire world in one generation. It's turned us into zombies or, 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 or something. Is no one here that, that I'm talking to right now is without a computer or, or, or a phone. You know, Bill Gates, people actually think Bill Gates is Dr. Frankenstein. Who's going to make that movie? I hope one of you does. Okay, here's another one. Look, California's on fire. It's not a joke. The environment is scaring the hell out of us. And the truth is, it always has. Okay, what did America, what did the settlers try to do? It's literally the word to settle. They thought they would come out and settle the, the wilderness. They thought they would tame the West. Yeah. This is nature, man versus nature, Godzilla rampaging. For most of our existence as a species, 
the biggest threat that we faced was nature herself. And cinematically, while plagues and viruses are pretty good, you know, they're not so visual. So instead we have things like the birds. Okay, one day the birds just said, that's enough of you guys. Uh, the poster was great for this. It said, the birds is coming. Or the ultimate man versus nature horror movie, King Kong. Here he is on the Empire State Building in 1933. That's when the Empire State Building still hadn't even been completed. You see the radio tower isn't on the top. And the Empire State Building was the ultimate symbol of man having conquered nature. Look at how high we can build something. And Kong was the ultimate symbol of nature. And they brought in these then state-of-the-art airplanes and shot them out of the sky. Clearly, it was a, a movie made by a bunch of white guys. Okay, let's talk about women for a moment. Here. This is a woman named Millicent Patrick. Millicent Patrick actually designed the creature from the Black Lagoon in 1954. She received exactly zero credit, never made another movie, was essentially drummed out of the movie business, and was almost forgotten until last year's biography of her called The Lady from the Black Lagoon. This is from the author Mallory O'Meara's introduction. Went the wrong way. I turned the page on the thing, but not here. Here's from the introduction of The Woman from the Black Lagoon. Horror is a pressure valve for society's fears and worries. Monsters seeking to control our bodies, villains trying to assail us in the darkness, disease and terror resulting from the consequences of active sexuality, death. These themes are the staple of horror films. There are people who witness these problems only in scary movies, but for much of the population, what is on the screen is merely an exaggerated version of their everyday lives. These are forces women grapple with daily. Women are the most important part of horror because by and large, large women are the ones horror happens to. Women have to endure it, fight it, survive it in the movies and in real life. In America, a woman is assaulted every nine seconds. Women as victims and warriors are, are classic in horror movies, but so are women as horror. Yeah. Mad Women and Destroyers. Stephen King and Brian De Palma, two guys, brought this amazing movie uh, uh, to, to, to existence. This young teen finally gets her period. Yes, she doesn't know what it is. You talk about your, talk about your secretions, but as she becomes a woman, and her creative powers rise, so rise her destructive powers, which she unleashes. She kills everybody who bullied her. She winds up killing everybody. And then she kills her repressed and oppressive mother, who is the true monster in the movie. See the original version of this here. Here's another one from David Cronenberg, the great. This is Samantha Egger in a movie called The Brood. Once again, the creative power of woman, what she births into the world can literally destroy all mankind. And let's just put this bluntly. Okay, a lot of men are freaked out by the most powerful sacred spot on earth, the vagina. They fear that it will, they're going to be rendered helpless by it. They're going to be pulled in, they're going to be drained, and then a little monster is going to emerge in a flood of viscera and totally consume their lives. That's what movies like this are about. And having a child is stressful too. There's a classic movie, a new fantastic movie, The Babadook, from Jennifer Kent, right? When a woman's psyche is wounded and madness looms because of maternity, grief, social pressure, the creative and the destructive impulses are explosive and usually fatal in a movie like this. There's a wonderful book by a woman named Kier Lejeunesse called House of Psychotic Women that's about this entire subgenre. Um, I mentioned the supernatural. Okay? So we have questions about things that go bump in the night, the veil between life and death. Your grandpa dies. We bury him, which is scary. We love grandpa. Now we're going to bury him in the ground. So now you, you say he's an angel watching over me. He's in heaven. He's watching over me. No, he's not. If he's watching over me, he's a ghost. Ghosts ain't angels, right? Here's Kubrick's The Shining. And there's a lot of things that can haunt us. There's an Indian burial ground in this movie that symbolizes the ghost of America. But more, there's, there's the, the ghosts. There's the, the hauntings of alcoholism physical abuse, past successes and failures that haunt us. There's another studio film from a bestseller. And though Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick, never won an Academy Award as the director, 
The guy who directed this, Robert Wise, won two Academy Awards for Best Director. He made this in between West Side Story and The Sound of Music. People that go before us leave unresolved stuff, right? And that unresolved stuff must be resolved. It must be solved, or it will continue to haunt us now and in the future. And The Conjuring, right? Directed by the superstar, James Wan. He's a kid from Australia. He became the biggest director, one of the biggest directors in the world, thanks to his love and understanding of the filmmaking techniques behind horror movies. He co-created Saw, Insidious, The Conjuring, Aquaman. He's quite amazing. And has this for scary. Okay. Why are zombies so popular? Why do people love zombies? Zombies are about the ultimate loss of identity. It's us and it's them. And whatever they are to you, whether it's liberals, gun nuts, sexists, Yankees fans, whoever your them is, they want you and they will not stop until they have you or until you are dead, right? You want to be one of them? You've got to run, run, run. This is made by Danny Boyle, another Academy Award winner. Here's a, a brilliant movie. If you haven't seen Train to Busan, please watch it. Zombies up the stakes of a father-daughter reconciliation, very real us and them dynamic on the Korean peninsula. It couldn't be more striking than it is in this film. And they owe it all to, excuse me, the Night of the Living Dead. It was created by George Romero, who was just a guy who was making commercials and industrial films in Pittsburgh. And he wanted to break out, he wanted to make some money, and he made this on an absolute shoestring. And it's one of the great independent success stories of almost of all time. Right? It, had a, it was in black and white. It had this incredible downer ending that was perfect for 1968, the year that Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were both assassinated. Um, and one of my favorite subgenres, as I mentioned, is the repressed expressed. Look at this. Here's Frederick March. This movie is almost 100 years old, 90 years old. He won the Academy Award for uh, his work in this picture. Look. Many of us learn as kids firsthand that monsters lurk inside of us, right? Daddy loses control out of nowhere, it seems. Mommy drinks from a bottle, right? She sure acts different. They call those things spirits for a reason. Dr. Jekyll drinks something and he turns him, Dr. Proper, into a raging id, his simian self, Mr. Hyde. Lust, like murderous intent, is in all of us and the volcanic expression of the id, the, the dark spirit essentially hulking out or lashing out. Well, it's a true story best told in horror terms. Or this doesn't look like a horror movie, right? Simone Simone from Cat People, the movie from the 40s that was made for peanuts by a guy named Val Luton. Look, until recently, or maybe even still, if, if one had a different feeling about one's gender, or sexuality than the norm, one was called monstrous. You know, imagine the self-loathing, the sadness, the wrath of having to repress and deny your own true self. Or what if you were, quote, normal, but you were told you can't have sex before marriage, right? You don't want to be bad, do you? Of course you do. It's not that you want to be bad. You're a healthy person with healthy urges. But if all your needs and desires had to be repressed, well, horror movies based on that repression are extraordinarily powerful and universal. Okay, let's talk about the horror of racism in America. This you know, is a huge subject. Uh, this was about it until the 70s. This is really about uh, the, the, this white woman. It's actually hard to make a horror story from horrible history. You know, if you just present the facts, they're ugly and you, you, you know, you have a tragedy or you have a howl of fury like like 12 Years a Slave, a magnificent movie, but that's a drama, it's not a horror movie. Or you, or you might have an exploitation movie like this. There were some fun, uh, lurid, manufactured movies in the, in the 70s. There was Blackula, there was Blackenstein, there was Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde. And there were, there were a few others, folks, but it took until Jordan Peele to really dig into the themes and the questions below the skin. Of course, racism is terrible. That's obvious, right? But in Get Out, in Get Out, he asks the outrageous question that is lurking in America. 
if you scratch a white person, will you always find a racist? And in us, he literally says, what's underneath the surface of America the beautiful is a doppelganger America built on a tortured black underclass filled with rage, pain, desire, and need. Us is you, S. And the brilliance is that these are entertainments that are able to present the horrors that we have to face before we can finally rise up and be free as individuals and as a society. Peel has made two of the best, most successful horror films in years. You got to remember this. No one wanted to make Get Out. No one. It took years to make. Before Black Lives Matter, it was considered too raw, too truthful, too crazy. And now suddenly and gratefully, there is there's antebellum, there's, there's bad hair, there's Lovecraft country, and there will be many, many more. And this Oscar-winning young filmmaker is hailed as a prescient genius. My hat is totally off. Okay, and then you've got lots of other things that we can talk about. My God, we've skimmed the surface. There's this guy, Dave Edgars. There's H.P. Lovecraft and this incredible movie, Reanimator, one of my favorites. Wes Craven and Nightmare on Elm Street, a whole series of movies that people love. Clive Barker, a brilliant writer in his Hellraiser series. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe in the movies. There's uh, a torture porn, right? Here's um, um, Hostel and Martyrs. It's another amazingly powerful um, a movie. Um, J Horror was a huge, huge subgenre. Um, one of my favorite movies of all time, Eyes Without a Face from France. See it, you can't believe it. Uh, this is the first real horror movie hit. Here's a movie that you never heard of, and rightly so. What a title. The Shriek of the Mutilated, made by the incredible uh, Roberta and Michael Findlay, who are famous for their unbelievably turgid, lurid, manufactured movies like Snuff. He made a movie called Invasion of the Blood Farmers. You got that right, Invasion of the Blood Farmers, and the man was chopped in half by a crashing helicopter. Uh, some would say a fitting ending because his films are probably actually evil. Uh, Larry Cohen made the great It's Alive and a lot of cool movies. And then there are other super talents like all of these wonderful folks, Guillermo del Toro, Mike Flanagan is really making his mark, the Sauska sisters. Uh, Julia Ducourneau, if you've not seen Raw, you must see this movie, it's extraordinary. The brilliant Lee Winnell and Jason Blum seems to have it going on, doesn't he? Okay, let's go on. I could talk about all those folks for a long time. I'm gonna talk about one more, one more subgenre. One more subgenre that's mature enough to understand the dirty, guilty secret of horror and of life. Though we're scared, sometimes we want to be with the wolf because the bad guy is sexy. See, once upon a time, we all lived under nobles, right? Now we have billionaires, we have stars, but then you might have a count like this, Count Dracula. This is Christopher Lee. He was handsome, he's wealthy, he's powerful. Imagine the celebrity. Here's a guy, he eats various dishes. He's not just eating gruel. You know, he has servants. His life is refined. And we, the common folk of Transylvania, we're gonna watch these private carriages with the beautiful people going up to the balls at his castle. And we're gonna know that our blood, sweat, and tears is what has afforded him and, 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 and his friends their lifestyle. And we covet what we can't have, which is this lifestyle. You know, And maybe if we can't marry a noble, if we're a peasant, we're not gonna be able to, maybe we could be a servant. You know, Maybe we could eat stuff that's not just gruel and have clean clothes. Wouldn't that be amazing? The gap between the haves and the have-nots was even bigger than it is today. But maybe if we looked something like this, the extraordinary Sharon Tate, who you all know who that is, main character in the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the real Sharon Tate. If we looked like Sharon Tate, well, maybe we can dream there's a Prince Charming out there for us or, or a future American president. You know, Look, we want to better ourselves, we all do. We are eager to learn to feast on the banquet of life. Yeah. And then we get the invite. Come, join us at the castle, you promising young, fresh-faced talent. We want what the Count has. And even if he's wealthy and powerful, he is envious and covetous of what we have. A young person's potential, right? Our innocence, our freshness, our beauty. He can drink it in. 
He can have it and he can destroy it. And we know stories about the girls and the boys who went up to the castle, they didn't come back. We want to go anyway. Right? I mean, kids know that drugs are bad. They try them anyway. You know, every kid knows that drinking and cigarettes are bad. Everyone smokes once in their life. Going to the castle is exciting. How else are we going to improve ourselves? He wants a massage, big deal, why not? Yes, Dracula, vampires are real, folks. Jeffrey Epstein was Count Dracula. Harvey Weinstein was too. They share the blood sucking, youth sucking, fresh idea sucking vampiric impulse of the powerful toward the weak, but sometimes willing of the corrupt toward the pure. Vampires are sophisticates who prey on our innocence and our desire for experience. And when our story starts, the Count, okay, here's a third version of the Count, Gary Oldman. He's old because he sucked the blood and the resources of his people dry, and he's got no more peasants to tax or kill or virgins to defile, so he has to move on. And this greedy, ambitious, middle-class broker, Jonathan Harker, comes down and happily sells the Count a place where he isn't known, and the Count leaves his, his, his old country in ruins to find fertile pastures. He's not going to a private island, he goes to England, and he meets a couple of young virgins, right? Mina and Lucy. And this guy is seductive as hell. He's rich, he's a noble night owl, he's got this groovy accent, he sucked some blood so he looks a lot younger, and they invite him into their lives. Now remember, a vampire, evil, must be invited into your home. You ask for it. And then he comes into Lucy's room at night, you know, and though she's scared, she's also excited. The quivering is the same. And he shows her his big, white, long teeth. And he penetrates her virginal flesh. And their secret fluids flow and intermingle and swooning the little death indeed. She is never the same. Right? There are very few distinctions in life as clear as are you a virgin or not? Have you been bitten or not? Are you one of us now or are you one of them still? Or rather, are you one of us still or are you one of them now? Losing your identity, losing your innocence, it's scary. We want it, but we fear it. And it is filled with shame and excitement. And these stories teach us how to deal with these powerful vampiric figures, as well as with some of the internal demons that sometimes seem to control us, right? One way is to take to the streets. Maybe it's with a torch or a pitchfork. Maybe it's peacefully, right? Hopefully it's voting. If you live in a country that permits it, in Dracula's time, they didn't permit it. You were kind of stuck. And Dracula, a despot, if there ever was one, ends even more simply and universally, okay? As night ends with day, the darkness that is Dracula ends with sunlight, yeah? Evil ends with exposure. The light of truth exposes the tormentor as nothing but a pathetic little creep casting big shadows in your life, but of no real substance. Nothing is as scary in the light. Not the vampire, nor the molester, nor the drug dealer, nor the hood-wearing racist fuck. Not even the fears inside your stomach or your chest. You expose them, you examine them in the light, and they will finally blow away. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the business because you're here for the business, enough theory and stuff. Here's something about business too. You get a genius filmmaker like Sam Raimi and he put himself on the map. This is what these filmmakers do. They put themselves on the map with the incredible possibilities inherent, sorry. They put themselves on the map with the incredible possibilities inherent in horror, right? Using the most cutting edge techniques and often made inventive because they don't have the budget. The best horror filmmakers push the boundaries of narrative filmmaking. They have to be groundbreaking and extreme because these stories, they take physical stakes that be go beyond life and death, that make spiritual journeys from the most base to the most aspirational, and they run the full gamut of emotions from anguish to ecstasy. And even more basically, folks, if you can scare people, 
If you can thrill people, especially without the crutch of a lot of money, then you got talent, right? And if you can scare people, the picture's gonna make some money and it will be noticed. Now, here's what I've got for you. Here's my business advice. Build it and they will come. Are you gonna become Robert Rodriguez or Steven Spielberg or Ava DuVernay? I don't know, you don't know. But if you're making movies and you're happy, who the hell cares? You know, now maybe you're gonna, you know, no one's gonna like your movies, that's a problem. Maybe you're gonna run out of steam or you're gonna run out of money. Or maybe, you know, you're gonna turn into some of these guys, J.D. Dillard. Nia DaCosta is incredible. NYU grad, Oz Rodriguez. These are just three, the talented folks who have made their bones and are now making their way thanks to horror. And here's a friend of mine. Oren Pelly doesn't look too scary, right? Here's a great story, okay? He's an immigrant game designer from Israel, got no college. He comes to San Diego. He works for years designing Madden football, right? He gets carpal tunnel. He can't use his, his hands at all. And he literally has no backup plans. Then somebody shows him the Blair Witch Project, which I'm sure you know is a brilliant horror movie, fantastic game-changing found footage movie. And he says, I can do that. And he bought a camera and for $15,000 using his own house, he shot a movie. And thanks to the insane shoots and ladders of Hollywood, paranormal activity became a worldwide phenomenon. He's also a producer on the Insidious movies. And now he is essentially retired. He lives in New Zealand. I hope you're out there, Oren. I love you. He's living in New Zealand with his wife and his three babies. Is that the exception, that story? Of course. Is it true? Absolutely. He had a great idea. It wasn't too original, right? It was brilliant, though. Bam. He made a picture that people loved and they clamored to see. Okay, remember I told you there were two reasons that people hate horror movies, right? And one was because they're scary. The other one is because they suck. Yeah, let me show you something. Okay. Here's a list of 50 or 60 movies. They're well-known horror movies, a lot of Academy Award winners, huge financial gains on these movies. And I put this up to lead into a conversation about why most people traditionally hate horror. You guys know what all these movies have in common, every single one of them? They've all been sequelized or remade or both. And almost all of them have been ripped off. Some of these movies have 10 or 20 other movies trailing behind them. It's like the long trail that follows the comet of genius. Here, take Jaws, for example, okay? Jaws, yes. Even the original Jaws, it is a horror movie. It's got a monster, it's man versus nature has three official sequels, right? Jaws 2, Jaws 3, and even the extraordinary Jaws the Revenge. Here's a quick story. Jaws the Revenge had Michael Caine in it. Michael Caine was shooting Jaws the Revenge when he won an Academy Award for Hannah and Her Sisters, and he couldn't be there to win the Academy Award. Anyway, later, somebody said, have you seen Jaws the Revenge? And he said, I'll do a bad Michael Caine. He said, um, I haven't seen it. I hear it's terrible. But I have seen the house that it and that's beautiful. Anyway, he did it for the money. Why not? I can't blame him. But how about these? Here are the movies that ripped off Jaws. Just some of them. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's unbelievable. What do I think of it? It's clear to me that this is a case of money-hungry ghouls with no imagination, with disdain for their audiences, turning what was beloved and full of creative juice and passion, sucking it dry until there's nothing left but an empty husk. Yes, it's a vampire story in Hollywood. Something fresh and beautiful and even inspiring is used and abused by men with the power to do their worst. The fucking car. At the end of the day, folks, here's what I've got for you. Horror is good. Even I love bad horror movies. The reason that horror is good is because it serves a simple, deep need, whether we know it or not. Because there are things that we no longer get in our everyday lives that we once had constantly. Just a few generations ago, or even now in many parts of the world, we lived with death. Right? If you wanted meat, it was slaughtered fresh. If you got sick or injured, you might well die. Attila the Hun died of a nosebleed. Death was handled locally by tribe or family. Everybody was there. It was a group right. 
and practically everybody learned the literal cold hard facts about death putrefaction disease and disposal daddy was nice but he got a toothache he died now he's dead meat and he's a danger to all of us because dead flesh meat rots and like in a zombie movie when a body dies if you don't dispose of it quickly it can infect and kill everybody even if it was daddy and that's why we evolved folks for rot to smell bad to us dogs and flies think rot smells like ambrosia we are still the same species who survived in the wild dealing with and accepting terror horror viscera the rest of it as intrinsic parts of our life but in a modern society we never see or experience them firsthand right and so we need to find other ways to experience them so that we can be most fully ourselves and experience our humanity and horror movies can help fill that void and here's something even cooler we we also evolved so that the tiniest noise or the or the change of foliage would make us jump instantly into flight fight or flight and again we're still that same beast right Although now through our technology, using artfully juxtaposed visuals and sound, we can sit safely here at home or in a theater and experience those emotional responses. It's actual terror. It's actual horror that we feel. It's not an approximation. We are exercising our nervous systems the way that they were designed to work, which is an amazing trick. It's a gift even that we have invented to bolster the magic of storytelling and provide us with the emotional experiences we don't get anymore but really want and need as humans. Now dealing with this hard, scary stuff actually makes us less afraid of monstrous wrongs and of death. Those that avoid dealing with these things are insulated, they're isolated from themselves. And I would urge you to consider horror as something that can make you calmer and better prepared for when life throws you a curveball or when some red flag from your past waves and suddenly and you might otherwise find yourself lashing out. Fearless self-examination cannot hurt you. It can only set you free and make you stronger. Horror can help you do that. And good horror like music or art, sex is revelatory. It reveals as it revels in the, in the, in the, in the viscerous, in the visceral, in the glorious power of our bodies alive. It's ecstatic, it's delirious. Okay, I have one last clip and I hope without the whole film that precedes it, it's gonna still hold the giddiness that it has in context. This final clip is from another Oscar winner and longtime horror nut, the climax pun intended of Peter Jackson's breakthrough hit, Brain Dead, known in this country as Dead Alive. <laughs> Party's over. I could keep going. See, life, horror is life affirming, you know, because when it's over, we're thankfully, here we are, we're safe, we're sound, we're able to say, I'm going to go on. I've experienced the terror of the jungle, the psychotic nuttiness of a zombie attack, and I'm not in danger. Here I am. I can enjoy my life, which I now see is bloody marvelous. It's wonderful to be alive. I will be careful moving forward, and I'm going to be carefree right now. Folks, I'm going to drink. 
I'm going to judge some costumes. I'm going to come in and talk to all of you in the, in the rooms. And I hope you had a good time. Uh, that's the sacred and the scared. I'm Jonathan Penner. Now let's party. Before you go, John, could you stop screen share? And I'm going to ha have you answer a few yes. from the audience before yes. the after party. So I just stop share. share. Stop share. Okay, so um, we have a couple of questions. One, um, which I think is really timely, um, which is, do you think that the pandemic will change our relationship to horror or inspire a new kind of horror? I have no doubt that it will. I, I don't know all the different ways that it will. I think that you're, I think that this generation is going to be forever affected by it. The way that kids were affected by the Vietnam War or the draft or, or um, a, a World War II, the depression, you know, oh yeah, COVID. And so it's going to affect the way that we tell stories, whether it's this kind of way, there certainly have been and will be horror movies told entirely over screens like this. And, and you know, um, separation from people, the way people's sexuality and the way they communicate with each other is, is already being changed. So I have no doubt, I can't wait to see some of the movies that people come up with. So yes, absolutely. Um, here's another question. Do you think that um, disaster movies fall into horror? And do you believe that there is a way to create an environmental horror movie? Although I would argue that King Kong is an environmental horror movie. Myself. Yeah, I mean, a, an environmental horror movie. I would say that all the man versus nature movies are kind of environmental. And, you know, a disaster movie like The Towering Inferno or Earthquake, yeah, they're sort of thrillers. They don't really use the language of horror movies so much, which tend to be much more personal, visceral, and psychological. You know, good horror movies are going to play in both those, in those fields. Um, I, I, I want to answer your question as well as I can, but, but I think that environmental horror movies, I mean, what's happening today, it's very hard. You know, you don't want to make an exploitation film. Fires of California, you know, is scary as shit. But you don't want to make a movie about the actual fires of California because then you're exploiting a terrible situation, I think. Um, Roland Emmerich makes a lot of movies like that. Maybe that's who you're sort of thinking about the day after tomorrow mm -hmm. and uh, 12, uh, 2012, pictures like that. I wouldn't call them horror movies, though. Um, we have uh, some Survivor fans who have some questions. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, let's see. So, well, we have one person who asked, uh, what was the recovery like after Survivor? I don't know which uh, season they mean, maybe when you got airlifted out, I mean, in a medical emergency, but. What was the recovery? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was airlifted out. I had a terrible infection and necrotic tissue in my knee and, and that took a long time. I mean, honestly, it takes a long time to recover because it's very trying and it's mostly the recovery from the shame of not winning, you know, of second guessing yourself and knowing that your stupid mistakes are gonna be live forever on television and everyone's gonna know that you're the guy who blew a million dollars three times. So I still haven't gotten over it entirely, but I, I have gotten, I, I got a lot out of being on Survivor and, and it did change my life. Um, Someone else Brian, asked. Brian De Palma always said, like, you should make a Survivor horror movie, you know, and I said, I, you should make a Survivor horror movie. <laughs> right, and then cast you in it. Um, <laughs> uh, here's an interesting question, back to horror for a second. Um, is there, why aren't there more horror films set in work organizations, or are there? We spend much of our lives in work organizations, we get socialized, we lead, we follow, there's sexual harass harassment, racism, sexism, you know, yet there aren't really horror movies set in these, in these situations. Do you have any thoughts about why that yeah, is? There, there are a couple, you know, it's, it's very hard because you kind of, there, there have been a couple, although of course the names don't come immediately to mind, you know, but again, it's like, that's, that's where, where do you go from there? Your boss is a vampire. Okay, that's an interesting story. Where there's something going on underneath the building, and like coma, you know, where 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 your your the firm, you know, is your your office is actually a front for some diabolical thing that's happening. Yeah, that makes sense. But actually taking the horrors of the workplace. Whoever asked that question, please write that script. It's a great idea. I wish I had a better answer, except it hasn't been done, and now it will be. 
It's, it's his or her idea. No one else can steal it. Don't touch it. Well, it's all yours. Go with it. Um, what's your favorite horror movie of all time and why? Uh, I have a couple. I would say The Fly, if I had to pick one. I love The Fly, uh, the Cronenberg Fly. I love uh, Eyes Without a Face. Is an amazing movie. If you haven't seen it, it's a quite extraordinary movie from 58. Um, um, I love this new movie, Raw, um, which is an am uh, amazing movie for college students. I'm sure all of your students have seen this movie. It takes place at a veterinary school in, in France, and it's amazing. Um, that's enough for now, I guess. I mean, and then you can go on. There's so many movies that I love. What about, this is an interesting question uh, from obviously from someone who is a film buff. What about the horror side of Russ Meyer? Well, I wouldn't say there is a horror side to Russ Meyer. I mean, he's a sick guy, but he's fabulous. <laughs> Russ Meyer, did he make a horror movie? I don't think so. I mean, he had some perversity. You, I, if you, for those of you who don't know Russ Meyer, and you should go look him up, he's, he's this amazing uh, indie um, exploitation filmmaker. He made nudie movies. And he sort of was run out of business by the hardcore porno business. He made softcore porno movies. And he was an extraordinarily talented guy um, uh, who made you know, insane movies. Most famous movies, Faster Pussycat, Kill, Kill, probably. He made a movie called Vixen, which was a massive hit. Made Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, which was written by Roger Ebert. Um, uh, Super Vixen, Beyond the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. He made a lot of movies um, with these extraordinarily gorgeous women. Um, the horror aspects, yes, he really dug into the dichotomy of sex and violence in the American, in the world psyche. And so, you know, people treated each other very badly uh, in some of his movies. But at the end of the day, he was a very conservative guy who had conservative notions about sex and womanhood. Um, I love his movies, but I don't think they're horror movies. If you guys want to watch them and, 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 and tell me I'm wrong, please do. Um, sort of a related question, I guess, about genre is um, do, what, uh, what, in what subgenre would you categorize horror films about disease or health? I, like, well, well, I mean, pandemic, for example, would you classify that as a horror movie? Or, one more time, what was the name? Uh, pandemic. No, I wouldn't. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a thriller, right? And it's almost a horror movie. This is something that you and I were talking about earlier, Nina, is that you really like thrillers, you like dark material, and you don't like the viscera. Right. And maybe you don't like the actual scares, you know, horror, being scared. Pandemic is essentially a thriller. It's kind of a, a disaster movie. And there's a little bit of viscera, right? There's some bat goo. I don't remember it. I haven't seen it in years. But it's not, it's not a horror movie, unlike Cronenberg's movie, um, um, of Shivers or Rabid, you know, these are pandemic horror movies about, about venereal diseases, things like that, extraordinary. His movies are kind of body horror pictures. And I guess that's the subgenre. You'd call it a body horror. It's about this dysmorphia. It's when in The Fly, there's an incredible scene as he's, he's a scientist, so he's fascinated by what's happening to his own body, even as he's horrified and he knows he's dying, he can't help, you know, he's looking in the mirror as his fingernail comes off and the audience goes like, oh, you know, and he squeezes the pus out of himself. And so, yes, everyone makes that face, but that's what we would all do. Isn't that what we all do secretly is we kind of do this when we're alone. And so horror, especially when it has this, these, this visceral stuff that deals with stuff that's very private, right? I'm going to get quiet because the, the, the fluids we only deal with when we're in private or when we're very vulnerable with somebody else. And to make those public, to put them on screen is extraordinarily shocking and horrifying and exciting, sometimes even sexy. So visceral horror movies, you know, you either have a taste for it, you're either ready to go there and you dig it or like, no, thank you. That does, that's a big turnoff. And that's a, that's a matter of taste, I think. Yeah, um, so this is a good, another sort of good jump off question from another uh, NYU LA faculty, Gerard Boccaccio, is why do you think viewers want to escape with a genre um, that is designed to stimulate fear and anxiety? And mm -hmm. as, as mm -hmm. you know, why, do we, why do we want to go through these horrible events? See, I, I think that, that every kind of movie and every kind of story which and all of them, if they're at all effective, tap into our emotions, right? And, and, you know, the release, 
the feeling of whatever you you get to feel at a good movie. When you watch Singing in the Rain and you get romance and ebullience and fun, okay, that's one thing that we want to go to. But to also say, I want to go on a roller coaster ride. I can't go to the amusement park, but I can turn on this movie. I want to tap into that sitting around the fire and getting scared. Or the fact that you sit around the fire and you know why you're scared. It's not just because people are telling stories, but because, no, wait, seriously, did you hear that? Do you hear that in my neighborhood? That's what I'm talking about, right? That like, oh shit, did you hear that? You know, what's going on, right? I'm making it up, okay? But, but you know, <laughs> taking yourself to that exciting kind of place and then you're safe at the end of it is fun. It is pure escapism. As long as you're willing to know that at the end of it, you're gonna have come through something and you'll be safer, better. You'll have had a great experience. That's what a good movie does. And that's what movies do, right? They take you on an emotional ride. They make you laugh. If it's a comedy, they make you scared. They make you thrilled. They, they make you cry sometimes. You know, who the hell wants to turn on a weepy? We all do. We all want to feel the, the, you know, the emotion of losing a loved one or, or maybe losing a loved one, you know, and then we feel better at the end of it. And we've gone through that very, very real emotional journey that movies take you on. It's not an approximation. It's an actual emotional trip that you go on. Um, I just want to remind everyone, we're going to do one or two more questions, but I want to remind everyone to scan the Q code in the chat and to get the link to the after party, um, just because we're going to be... Giselle, I'm saying hello to my dear friend Giselle, who just quoted something that we have joked with each other for 40 years. Laughter turns to tear. It's always ha 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 until it's boo hoo hoo. <laughs> yes, Giselle, I'm so happy you're here, dear. I hope you liked it. All right, so I'm going to do one, one or two more questions. Yeah, please. Um, do you think what's what do you think streaming is going to do to horror, particularly with the haunting of Hill House and how sort of that's? I mean, every I know every streamer you turn on right now because it's close to Halloween is really pumping out the horror. Um, but what do you what do you think streaming will do? I mean, it's impacting all content to some degree. What do you think it's going to do to? Uh, our well, I think what's fascinating is that you know all all storytelling is changing shape, right? You can have a TikTok, which is almost a, you know maybe it's a story or it can you know can scare you for a second or make you laugh or you know just get a kind of very thin emotional response. The Haunting of Bly Manor, which is fabulous if you haven't seen it, and The Haunting of Hill House. I mean, Mike Flanagan is kicking ass as far as I'm concerned, you know, these are long form ghost stories. And he said, you know, well, how many kinds of ghosts hauntings can we get into a movie and really explore, dive into these characters and keep it exciting. He did it for nine hours with the haunting of blind Manor. Very, very hard to do, you know, so not all of them are going to be good. There's a lot of shit, you know, a lot of people are going to make bad, look, a lot, most of everything is bad. Let's face it. All right, you know, and you got to go through 10%, you know, good stuff through 90% bad stuff to get to the 10% good stuff. Um, um, what's it going to do? It's going to continue to do it now. Finally, there is horror TV. It was almost impossible in the network age to make horror TV. You could either do an anthology show, right? Tales from the Crypt or, or Twilight Zone or something like that, you know, or um, it was a movie. Because in TV and network TV, you couldn't kill off your protagonists. There was no serialized TV, really, unless it was a soap opera, daytime soap opera. There was there was a dark shadow. I mean, listen, I can go into the whole history of TV horror, but streaming is fantastic for horror. They're making more horror than ever. I say, yes, make more. It's okay. great. So one last question, one last reminder to everybody to upload your costumes and grab a link to the after party. But one last question, which I think is a good one. Um, what is your advice, your best piece of advice for someone, a student who's trying to break in um, into, into filmmaking? What do you, what's your most solid piece of advice that you would give? Uh, again, I would say, and it sounds facile, but it's, I hope it's not, make films, okay? Make them. If you, can make a, if you can make me jump, not just me, anybody, you take 10 minutes, two minutes, don't breathe, lights out. Some of these movies are based on microscopic short films, right? If you can get your agent, an agent that you send that to, to jump in three minutes with a camera and a kid underneath a bed, you're gonna get, you're gonna get something from that. You will. If you're just gonna talk about it, well, maybe you're gonna get some nice talk, but you're not gonna get as much as the guy who's out there shooting right now. And when I say guy, I mean person, right? Anybody can film now. There's nothing stopping anybody from using this device. 
Orrin Pelly took a little camera, $15,000. He made a billion dollar franchise out of that. Now that's not easy to do, but you won't know until you try. And well, if you're enjoying it- well, course, the beauty of art. One more beauty time. Of art, it's, it's generally inexpensive to make. And if it hits, it can have a high return. I mean, look at Blum, the whole, you know, Jason Blum built an empire on that theory. Yes, there, there, there's no reason to spend a lot of movie on uh, money on horror movies. Most of them stink. You know, there's, there's almost a law. The more you spend on a horror movie, the more you're wasting. Because at the end of the day, it's getting one person alone in a hallway and making the audience jump. You know what I mean? It's the psychological and it's the visceral. And you don't need a lot of money to do it. You can waste a lot of money doing it. So that's my advice. Get an idea and start shooting and start cutting. Flanagan was an editor. He was a reality TV editor. And he edits all of his own stuff. He knows exactly what he wants. He moves very, very quickly. Not in the shooting, but in the editing. Okay? So start making movies. There's no excuse not to. And, and if you're making movies, then who the hell cares? Right. You know, if you build it, they'll come to you. And you just keep building it until they come. I swear to God, it'll work. I swear. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, so much uh, for coming. Um, before you leave, make sure you copy the link to the next party. Okay, uh, where do I find the link? I'm gonna, I, somebody sent it to me. Yes. Oh, bravo. Thank you. All right. So everyone, as soon as you've copied that, log out, log into the new Zoom. We'll see you for breakouts. And uh, again, log your costumes up to the mood board for a chance to uh, have a chat with Jonathan or win a $100 Visa gift yes, card. Yes, and I'm going to ask you which one you'd prefer. Okay, fair enough. Okay, because the winner should get either the second prize or the first prize, depending on what they want. Okay, but here we go. We're all going to meet in a second, or at least three of you. Also, everyone who registered will receive the recording tomorrow. Just a reminder, I see that's coming up in the chat. Right. We will. A lot of technical difficulties on Penner's side. I'm sorry, guys. Yes, but I think that the presentation made up for it. Okay, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm a Luddite. Okay, I'll see you in a second. All right, thank yeah. you, guys.